apologies for the delay to the start of this. We had some technical difficulties, but a warm welcome to you all for joining us. Tuatahi, kamihi atu ki a koe e te tōkane e moana. Moto tai mai kei wainga nui a mātou i tēnei ahi ahi, moto tautoko ki tēnei kaupapa i tēnei rangi. Nō reira te nā koe ki a koe o te rā, ki a tātou katoa, tēnā tātou. A warm welcome to everyone. My name is Grant Bergen, uh, and I'm going to lead this conversation with Moana Jackson. I'd like to introduce our guest to you all, although for many of us in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and indeed the world, he doesn't need any introduction. Moana Jackson is of Ngāti Kahunganu Rongo Mai Wahine and Ngāti Pro descent, is one of New Zealand's leading thinkers on the Treaty of Waitangi and Māori constitutional issues. He is widely considered to be one of the most influential minds shaping Indigenous rights, both in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and internationally. And he has, for many decades, been a strong, and courageous campaigner against injustices and inequities. Moana, tēnā koe, welcome to this webinar. Ā tēnā koe, Grant e te ho. Ā tēnā koutou, ā tēnā koutou huri no tēnā tātou katoa. He tika ki au i tēnei wā ke te poroporo aki te aroa waka, te whaea, te kuia, kā Daniels. Nō reire e kui, a mai mai, a mai mai, a mai mai e haere. Ki a koutou katoa te hongo ora, a huri noa tēnā tātai, te tēnō ho Grant, a kanu te mihi atu. Ai, me koe hoki e hoa. Moana, I would like to start this conversation by referring to the COVID-19 pandemic that is exercising us right throughout the world. Uh, we have just recently, two hours ago, in fact, had our Prime Minister address the country simply to prepare us for COVID-19, uh, which will eventually transmit itself throughout our communities. Um, Moana, we know that pandemics tend to have uh, just proportionately negative impact on Indigenous communities throughout the world peoples of colour, and indeed for us in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we know we have the evidence from 2000, uh, 1918, 1919, the Spanish flu pandemic, Māori were seven times more likely to die than other peoples. Do you have any comments to make about the COVID-19 at this point in time? Uh, kia ora, yes, I do. Um... There are a couple of points I'd, I'd like to make. The, the first is that this pandemic is changing the world and it will place pressure on many of the things that I think as Māori we hold precious. Um, but I'm actually proud of the way that our people have responded so far. Uh, the decisions made by individual hapu about how they will regulate the use of the marae, um, different iwi closing their borders. Um, I, I think the quite necessary comments by a number of our Māori doctors and health professionals raising the issue which you raised, that there is concern that sort of one size fits all approach will not necessarily work and that Māori are already disproportionately represented in all of the negative health st statistics. The evidence from research and the ho-order findings of the Waitangi Tribunal make it clear that there are inequities throughout the health service, that there is racism within the health service. And I would hope that although I think the government has made many positive and quite courageous moves to date that it will listen to our people, take advice from our people. Otherwise, 
I have a very real fear that our people will fall through the cracks and the tragedies we suffered in 1918 and 1919 may revisit us. At the same time, I'm confident that our people will survive, that this country will survive, and that our whānau, hapu and iwi will survive. We survived colonisation all the issues and mamai and new diseases that that brought to our shores. But it will also challenge us, it will challenge us, as I said, on some of the things we hold most dear, like the tangihanga, for example. Um, but our tikanga has always been flexible. I think colonisation tried to freeze our tikanga into some sort of narrow, confined, meaning, but it has always been adaptable in my understanding. The values which underpinned it have been really basic to who we are as our people. And as each hapu makes its own decision about how to deal with tangihanga, um, I think our people will keep in mind that the main purpose of a tangihanga is to provide space for the whānau to grieve and to provide space for others to grieve with the whānau because the grieving leads to the healing after the loss but a whānau must not be left to grieve alone and so it's been heartening that though hapu have made quite different decisions about how they will deal with tangihanga is a very clear recognition of that dual purpose that the whānau pane must have space to grieve and there must be some way in which their grieving will not be done alone and that is where social media and other new technologies will be of some value I think although that raises other issues because Māori are less likely to have access to social media and it's those sorts of issues as well as the general health inequities which I would hope the Crown will listen to our people about. Um, I, I, I have been very impressed uh, with the Māori response to this particular pandemic and I recall in 2004 when we had the last big scare, that we weren't as prepared as we are this time. One of the issues that concerns me as a grandfather is um, having to say to my grandchildren, my mokopuna, uh, if you've got a runny nose, you're not allowed into the house to see papa. Do you have any issues like that, Moana? Yes, well, that is one of the difficult things and I think people of our generation will have to face um, our mokopuna are precious and special. Um, our age group are regarded as one of the more vulnerable groups and because of the disproportionate effects of um, ill health among our older people, that's one particular issue. But related to that, I think, is the necessary ties and contact with mokopuna and how we navigate that is going to be a test for us, I think. It is indeed. Thank you. Um, thanks for those comments, Moana. Look, can I, um, I want to take you back to the Hedi days of the 1980s, and in particular, towards the end of the 1980s. That was when I first met you, actually. Um, and I just want to talk to you around the late 80s, and, and in this country, and indeed the world, uh, we were going through some significant change around neoliberal and economic reform and so on and and the state sector was being stripped and unemployment in this country in 1988 was 100,000. Uh, many of those were Māori. Again, we suffered disproportionately at the hands of neoliberalists. At that time, Moana, and I recall this, you were part of a group and I think you were leading the group you were writing a report, E Fai Panga Ho, a new perspective, which was examining uh, the New Zealand criminal justice system and its bias 
against Māori. Um, would you like to comment on that particular report, which was released at the same time that John Rangiho's Puao Tatatu report with Don Hall and so on that was released around about the same time? Um, would you like to comment on, on uh, Hefai Pangaho, the first report, A New Perspective? Well, the report Hefai Pangaho came after three years of korero around the country with our people. And the question we asked, the first time our people have ever been asked this question, surprisingly, is why do you think so many of our mokopuna are in jail? And they had very clear answers um, to that question, that the criminal justice system was racist. The same sort of information they gave to John Rangiho and Puao Chautatu, that the Department of Social Welfare was institutionally racist. Um, but they always framed that racism within a much wider context. And that was the context of colonization, the dispossession of our people. And so based on those three years of korero, and I worked with two amazing people who were young people then, um, Hanemo Awatere and Dean Harpeta. Um, we took what our people had told us and tried to frame that within a general context of what could be done. Because at that stage, over 50% of the male prison population was Māori men. Um, the proportion of Māori women in prison wasn't quite as high, but it was still worrying. And so how would we deal with that? And the responses that came from our people, we framed within two interrelated sets of ideas, if you like. One was what we called the offender-based responses. How can we deal with the things that might impact upon our people um, and on some occasions, perhaps lead to harm being done. The second one, and the more substantive one really, was to focus on what we called at that time the system-based issues. That is, what was it about the criminal justice system that led it to be institutionally racist, what led it to imprison so many of our people, and so on. And as you will recall, the response to the report um, was less than welcoming. Um, the government of the time at first declined to publish the report. Um, then after submissions from some of our rangatira at the time, it was finally published. But very few of its wide ranging recommendations um, were followed. And in the intervening 30 years, um, the situation has not improved. In fact, the, as many people know, um, the number of the prison population of Māori men has remained at about 51% of the total. But of most concern, um, the imprisonment rates of our women, our women now make up over 60% of the female prison population. And those figures, I think, are shameful figures. One of the people we interviewed said they indicated a moral failure. And so because of that, we undertook, beginning five years ago, a new research pro process. And I've been working again with two amazing young people, um, Nawai McGregor and Anne Wapu, and we'll shortly be releasing our report um, to, to check why things have not changed and why, in relation to our women, they've actually got worse. Why do you think there's a, there was a, a very poor response from the government back in 1988 so that very little was done? What was the reason for that in your view? If I can frame that answer within the research that we're just completing and the report we're writing at the moment. Um, one of the things that became apparent as we started talking to our people in this round of discussions, and we ended up talking to over six and a half 
thousand of our people around the country. We talked to over 500 of our people who have either been in prison or are in prison, and we talked to a number of people who were harmed by wrongdoing. And what was quite different in the court at all this time was that there was a lot more reference to what was happening to Indigenous peoples overseas, and particularly what was happening in Canada, the United States and Australia, where the imprisonment rates for Indigenous peoples are almost exactly the same as those for our people. So what we've done in this latest research is shift the focus and to ask a more general question, which is, why do colonizing states imprison so many indigenous peoples? And when you ask that question, the research focus shifts to the power of the state, how it assumed the power to imprison indigenous peoples, why it first assumed that power, and the way it is exercised today. So this report is quite different. It's transnational in its approach, and its conclusions are much more widespread than looking just at the criminal justice system, because it looks at the wider power structures of which that criminal justice system is a part. And so in some ways, the corridor with our people has led us this time to a quite different place in terms of criminal justice research. And the reason the 1988 report in the end, I think, was not acted upon, why it was consigned to the cellar in many cases, um, was because it did raise fundamental questions about the power of the state that raise fundamental questions about the treaty relationship. And those same questions are being asked this time around, but being framed within that wider international um, context. Because if you look at the figures for the imprisonment of Indigenous peoples, there are two responses. You can say Indigenous peoples are being imprisoned in such large numbers because they have some criminal gene. Well, that is clearly fatuous and racist. Or you can ask, what is it about a colonizing state? What is it about colonization that leads them to imprison so many indigenous peoples? And as I said, when you ask that question, the research takes you in a quite different place. With your research, and particularly internationally, did you come across any answers to the problems we're facing? Well, yes, we, our people always have answers. Um, the question is whether the Crown will listen to the answers. Um, and the answers we received in Canada, the United States and Australia um, were really similar to the answers we received from our people. In fact, the first hui we attended in Sydney in Australia with a group of 40 Aboriginal men and women who had been in prison. Um, I remember thinking at one stage during that corridor that if I closed my eyes and ignored the accent, it could be our people talking. And so the answers were similar, that inherent within colonization is a need to control the people you are dispossessing. If you're going to take over a people's land, take over their lives and take away their power, then you have to find ways of controlling them. And in each of those countries, including New Zealand, the criminal justice system became one of those mechanisms of control and it remains the same today. And so those colonizing states are also carceral states and the criminal justice system, the relationship it has with indigenous peoples, comes from that history of what criminologists call carcerality. Mona, uh, the relationship that we as Māori people in this country have with the Crown has been a very difficult one. 
uh, it's a very cynical relationship and it continues to be a difficult one. We've talked for a long time about tino rangatiratanga, uh, self-determination, and you've done a lot of work around constitutional reform. Would you like to talk about your work in that space? Well, it, it's related really to the long discussions that our people have had ever since 1814. Um, and the rejection of the still held crown view that on the 6th of February, 1840, every Māori in the country woke up and said, we don't want to make our own decisions anymore. We'll give that authority to the crown. And so the presumption that in the English words of the treaty, we gave away our authority to the crown. But in Te Tiriti, of course, which is a document which most Māori signed and which Governor Hobson signed, there was no such session of sovereignty. There was a reaffirmation of our mana and of our tinoranga tiratanga. And so the treaty debate ever since has been about that tension between the Crown assumption of absolute authority and the retention of our right as Māori to make Māori decisions. And so when the, we were asked in 2010 or 11, I think it was, by the Iwi Chairs Forum and by other bodies to conduct a constitutional discussion with our people around the country. And it was chaired by Professor Margaret Mutu from Atikahu. And I was asked to convene the hui. We were actually not doing anything new. We were picking up on a discussion that our people have had ever since 1814. And so a lot of the corridor was not new either. And what was remarkable, particularly about the corridor, was that again, it reflected the aspirations and the discussions held by other indigenous peoples and other colonized countries about how they can reclaim their authority. And so what Matike Mai, the, the working group on constitutional transformation did was travel around the country. And again, we talked to over 5,000 people and say, if, if this country could be governed differently tomorrow, what might it look like? And based on that corridor, we then came up with a number of suggestions for how a process of constitutional transformation might occur. Part of that process was to have a national convention next year, um, five years after the release of the report to see what else we need to do to process that conversation. And then in 2040, um, to look at a process of complete constitutional transformation. And that ties in really closely to the work that we've been doing on the criminal justice system as well. Because ultimately, if you ask why do colonizing states imprison so many indigenous peoples, then you have to look at the power that they have assumed to do that. And that then becomes again a constitutional issue. And that also again becomes an issue related to say, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the international recognition of a right of self-determination. So like so many things within the Maori intellectual tradition, if you like, they are all interrelated. They share a whakapapa. And the question is whether this country is yet ready to take those next steps in our treaty journey. Moana, I've got a bunch of questions coming through. That with your permission, I just might get a couple and read them to you. Yeah, sure. So the first one is from Nehana, and it says, how do we keep our kaimahi, our Māori workers and government sectors safe from unsafe cultural practices that Tauiwi managers direct? When Māori workers raise issues, they are seen as troublesome. Any, any response to that? 
Well, I often think that while it is most of the time glorious and wonderful to be Māori, it can also often be really difficult. It can be a real struggle because we are struggling against injustice. We're struggling against racism. We're struggling against the ongoing history of colonization. And those of our people who choose to work within Crown agencies are often brought face to face in a very direct way with that conflict between the assumed absolute power of the Crown to govern and the retention of the Māori belief in our right to claim mana motuhake, to claim te noranga te ratanga, and so on. And the only advice really, and I'm always hesitant about giving advice, but the only advice I can give is that we are not alone in that struggle. We're, wherever we stand in the struggle, we are not alone. That we stand in, in the light, not the shadow. We stand in the light of our ancestors who fought different struggles and our obligation is to wage the particular struggles that we now confront in the hope that our mukapuna will have different struggles. Um, but that decision by some of our people to work with the Crown agencies, often for the best of intentions, is inevitably fraught with difficulties, I think. If I have a look at the contemporary political situation uh, in our world today, what I see in Moana is the polarization of the far right and the polarization of the left. Uh, and many people in the middle who are confused. Uh, so we've, if we have a look at, at Donald Trump and if we have a look at Brexit and so on, um, we've experienced um, significant turmoil really in terms of the politics. As far as indigenous peoples are concerned and ourselves as Māori, uh, and we're beginning to see in New Zealand as well, that kind of polarization. Um, how do you view it from a Māori indigenous perspective, those two areas? I think it's important to always remember that left wing and right wing are colonizing constructs. They're not yeah. Māori constructs. Um, traditional Māori politics was whakapapa based, was based on the land to which you belonged. Um, was based on who you were as a mukapuna and, and the distinction between left wing and right wing that was part of the colonial imposition in this country. The fact that worldwide that division is now leading to polarization um, actually is not surprising to me because there's an inevitable tension within that division. You are forcing people into discrete points of view rather than seeking commonalities and although Māori society like any society always has its differences that's part of being human um, the method in which the differences were resolved is quite quite different um, there's a strange belief in western democracy that you reach the best decisions through conflict so you have the government and the opposition um, the Māori political understanding that, that I've grown up with is that there is conflict, of course, but the conflict itself does not lead to resolution. The resolution comes from understanding where the conflict began. And that, that goes back to a quite different philosophical construct. Whakapapa, who are you? Where do you belong? And those Māori constructs in the last... 170 ideas, of course, have been overlaid with those Western colonizing models. So we even have, since 1840, over 30 different crown definitions of who or what is a Māori. They even took away, within that left-right dichotomy, and the ability of our people to, de to define who we are. And so they introduced something like the blood quantum 
and you could only be Maori if you had a certain amount of Maori blood. And that's scientifically a nonsense, but its effects have been devastating on, on our people. And so we have people talking about, oh, he's only 158th Maori, or she's only a half caste, and so on. And the response I often give to that is, you can't have half a mokopuna. You can't have a 158th mokopuna. And so when I hold my newborn mokopuna, they might have papa that comes from England, from France, from Tuhoi, from wherever, but they are beautiful and whole. And it's that same sort of conceptual approach, which I think frames traditional Māori politics. Where do we fit? How do we belong? And so on. And that brings me back to the issue of the tangihanga we touched on briefly before in talking about COVID-19. Because in this country before 1840, Iwi and Hapu had lots of different ceremonies and rituals to mark our passage through life. So their ceremonies when a baby was born, ceremonies which are now more well known like burying the baby's whenua and the whenua, which was not just a lovely poetic cultural thing. It was a statement of belonging that that baby whose whenua was being buried had entitlements to that land. And then there were ceremonies and rituals when boys and girls reached puberty because that marked another stage. They weren't separate rituals, they were all interrelated as part of one's whakapapa. What colonization did was remove all of those rituals and ceremonies. And the only one that left us was the ritual of our dying. The only one that left us was the tangihanga. And so that has assumed that amazing importance and relevance in our lives. But what I hope might come out of COVID-19 is that not only do we find ways to preserve the essence of tangihanga, but we take the time to look at reclaiming those other ceremonies of life those other ceremonies that cemented those mukapuna and the whakapapa to which they belong. And if we do that, then we are rebuilding, if you like, that Māori political framework, which is based on what some iwi call a state of air, a state of balance, a state of calm. And that is completely at odds with the adversarial notion of left-right park our politics. And while traditionally, I think, there was a real Māori interest in that there had to be an interest in that political system in the left, um, in many cases, the left has been as damaging to Māori in many ways as has the right. Um, but I understand those of our people who work within that area. I have a nephew, as you know, who works in Parliament, and I have tremendous respect for him. But in the end, it is not a Māori place. It is not a tenora and a teratama place. And so part of the idea of constitutional transformation is not just to look at the way in which decisions are made, but the values which underpin them. And those values must be based on things that bring us together rather than foster point scoring and negativity and so on. Mona, can I talk to you about Whakapapa and the Māori diaspora, which is spread right across the world? Uh, and so I have 18 grandchildren. I have Samoan Māori. Tongan Māori, French Māori, Pākehā Māori, I've got all kinds in my whānau, as indeed we all do. There is about to be a debate in this country about population policy and who should or who should not be let into this country. I'm interested in your comments on that 
particularly in relation to our place as Māori, uh, tangata whenua from Aotearoa. There's an old um, English saying which I've used for years, um, which is the name of names is the father of all things, which is a very gendered patriarchal statement, but I think there's a, a truth in it that, that if you are able to define your own truth, then you control that truth. And one of the difficulties in any population debate is that we have been excluded from the defining. In fact, colonization has redefined us. So we have lost that notion of whakapapa being the thing that binds us together. And as I said before, you're only half Māori or a quarter Māori. And to extend that, for me, Te Tiri Te O Waitangi was the first immigration act. We set the rules on who should come the terms on which they should come, that they would accept the jurisdiction of iwi and hapu. Just as, for example, if an English person travelled to France, they would accept the jurisdiction of France. In colonisation, they changed that convention and said, oh, if we travel to the land of primitive indigenous peoples, then they had no jurisdiction for us to respect. So we will carry our own law with us. As I said, who is a Māori or who is not Māori? And that has led to a lot of the issues that, that we now face. So the population debate, who should come, how many should come, the whole immigration debate, is one from which Māori have been largely excluded in any positive sense. And so it becomes a political football. Um, and for our people who should come here as Manuhiri, who have a right to be here, was never framed in that way. I don't know if that answer makes sense, sorry. No, 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 it does absolutely. And I'm getting lots and lots of questions, but I'm just gonna keep going on and I'll allow time for some questions to be asked. Um, I'd like to talk to you, please, about your experience internationally. Um, I know that you've done lots of work with the United Nations, particularly around the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, can you talk to us, please, about your experience there? Um, how was it? What were the outcomes and so on? Well, our, our, our people have a long history of internationalism, of course. Um, we were traveling the Pacific for centuries um, before James Cook stumbled here, for example. Um, so we have always been internationalists. And then when this agreement was arranged with something called the Crown, um, we became internationalists in a different sense, that we were seeking a particular internation relationship with this new entity called the Crown. The Crown then betrayed that promise and every breach of the treaty. And so our people began to make a number of journeys to England to try to meet with the Crown in the 19th century. Um, and that again was nothing new. The issues were new, but the idea of our people being internationalists was not. And in the mid 1920s, a group of Rangatira heard about this new international body called the League of Nations, which had been set up after World War I. And so they traveled to Geneva and were effectively denied entrance, were not allowed to meet, um, because it was decided that we were not nations and that was a League of Nations. And one of the rangatira who traveled on that time kept a diary and the day that our people were refused admission he wrote in his diary perhaps the halls of this palace are not yet ready to hear the voice of our people 50 years later in 1973 there was a new international body called the united nations 
and the Human Rights Division of the United Nations took over the former League of Nations building in Geneva. And so indigenous peoples, mainly to begin with from the Americas, began to travel to Geneva just as our old people had done. And they were quickly followed by other indigenous peoples, including our people. And although we were really aware that the United Nations, like the League of Nations, was an organization of states, it was nevertheless we felt a place where we had a right to be. And so the many people like Aroha Mead, Nanakum and Hinnick, Erihapiti Murchi, um, Archie Tairor, a number of our people who from those very beginning days sought to cement an international place for us. And part of that international place was to draft a declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples. And the main reason for doing that was that it was to be a declaration of human rights. And what colonization did was deny our humanity. We were somehow less than human. And so it was our hope that by drafting this declaration, it will be part of the restoration of our humanity. So that if we could be recognized as having the human rights that every other human had, like the right of self-determination, then we would be part of that journey to reclaim who we were, not just as internationalists, but as fully human beings. And when after nearly 20 years, the declaration was finally put to the vote in the General Assembly, as everyone knows, four countries voted against it. Um, Australia, Canada, the United States, and New Zealand. And if you want to understand the reasons why that was so, then the reasons are exactly the same as why those four states continue to imprison so many indigenous peoples. They are colonizing states and to recognize self-determination as a threat to their assumed absolute sovereignty. Mm. If we talk about human rights, then we can't go past the issue of, it's not only personal racism, uh, but it's also institutional racism. Now, I know that you were involved uh, in the case, there was a recent case in New Zealand to do with Bob Jones and racist behaviours that he exhibited uh, in terms of us as Māori. Do you have any comment to make about that particular case? Yes, well, I, I was really honoured when I was asked by Renee and her lawyers if I would give evidence on their behalf. The evidence I was asked to give was whether, in my view, um, the writings of Bob Jones indicated racism and whether they were examples of hate speech. Mm -hmm. I prepared the brief and then two days before I was to deliver it, um, Bob Jones withdrew from the case. So I was delighted for Renee, um, but personally disappointed actually, and that I wouldn't have the chance to say in court what I think the evidence clearly showed. And um, for those who are interested, Itangata will be publishing an adaptation of the brief that I was going to present in court. But Bob Jones is just one example of a much wider issue. Um, the great colonizing theorist Franz Fanon, who wrote particularly about French colonization, said that by its very nature, a colonizing state is a racist state. If you take over the lands and power of the people because you think there are, they are inferior, and you replace them with your own institutions, then that is a racist act. And so racism is not just a personal attribute of considering yourself better than or superior to others. It is a, a system of denying the full humanity of others. It is a structural ideological system. 
and colonization is part of that ideological system. And although colonizers colonize to take land, to make profit, the reason they did so was mediated all the time through racism. So we will take these indigenous people's lands, we will make profit of it, and we can do that because they are inferior to us. And so individuals who express racist ideas, who demean our people in all sorts of personal and collective ways, are only part of a much wider structural and systemic state of racism. So that there is, if you like, the personal and the ideological racism. They are interrelated because the people who are most often abused by personal racists are also the people rendered powerless by the systemic and institutional racism of colonization. Um, I'm just going to read a, a, read a question to you, Moana. Uh, what is the way to ban or shut down hateful speech in a way that deals with their freedom of speech defense. Can we say hateful members are unwelcome if we want to keep the value of monarchy, tanga and totoko? Do you have any comment on that one? Hateful freedom of speech versus hate speech? I, th I think freedom of speech is a very important human right, but in colonizing countries, it is become a license to abuse. And so all of the claims about, oh, this is a right of free speech have tended to be made in the last five or so years by white people defending the privilege of other white people to demean Māori and other people of color and to hide that behind the notion of free speech. But my view about free speech, like any human right, is that it is a reciprocal right. And so to exercise your free speech does not mean, as I've said often, that you have a right to make people be free. And hate speech is calculated to make people less free, whether it's politically, socially, emotionally, spiritually, and so on. And it can take many different forms and free speech can be abused in many different ways. So the controversy last year, for example, over Israel Folau's comments about gay people was defended by some as free speech, but it was made from a position of privilege on platforms that most young, vulnerable gay people did not have access to. And so it made them not only unsafe, but this free. And similarly, people like Bob Jones, who have been accused of racism, have had access to platforms to demean Māori and other people of colour that Māori and other people of colour have not had access to. And that denial of access is not only an infringement of Māori people's right of free speech, but is a denial of the actual notion of free speech itself. And part of the journey that I think this country is on is to recognize the race base of colonization. And when we can have honest discussions about that, then we begin to deconstruct what colonization has done. We begin to protect those who are most hurt by the abuse of free speech. So to be honest, I find a lot of the recent commentary on free speech to be tiresome. I find it to be destructive and an abuse of the right of free speech itself. So that while people rushed last year to defend the right of two Canadian racists no. to come here and demean people of colour on the grounds of free speech, those people were noticeably silent about Renee Mahi's right of free speech to challenge what, Joan, what Bob Jones had said. And that's the whole hypocrisy, essentially a racist hypocrisy that uses free speech in a way that makes others less free. Mm, kia ora. How, here's a question from Safari Moana. How do we strike the balance 
between using government assistance to rebuild our traditional systems and maintaining our own self-determination? Well, there are contradiction in terms. Um, in the current situation that our people are in, where we do not have self-determination, um, I think our people will do as we have always done. We will take whatever avenues are available to achieve our manamu to haki. And because the Crown has taken so much of that away, then the Crown has an obligation to help restore that. But the Crown can't define what that is. You are only self-determining if you can define for yourself how you determine your destiny. And, and, and so for me, the eventual solution is not how do we use current crown structures, but how do we reconstruct Māori structures within a different constitutional relationship. And that in a way was part of the purpose of the Constitutional Transformation Working Group. But if our people who work within Crown agencies are able in some way to facilitate that process, then that will be helpful. But we are misguided, I think, if we believe we can achieve te noranga tiratanga through kawanatanga. They are a fundamental contradiction in terms. Adrian McLeod asks the following. It's refreshing to hear your insights on the limitations of partisan politics. Can you clarify for us what kinds of politics we might see emerge from constitutional transformation? Well, a people's right of self-determination, in my view, comes from the land to which they belong. And so whether our iwi called it tinoranga tiratanga or manamotu hake or Mana take take, and we had a number of different names for that concept of power. It was a power derived from, of, and for the land. The current adversarial Westminster system is called that because it came from another place. It did not grow from this land and the ineffable hopes of this land. And so the process of constitutional transformation for me, is to find a way in which the relationship envisaged in Te Tere Te Waitangi is expressed through constitutional processes that are deeply embedded in this land. And if we are able to do that, then those people who have come to make their home in this land will have a place to stand. Hmm. That place will depend upon the mana that I'm a tiratanga, if you like, that comes originally from the land. Um, there's a young Pākehā writer, um, Max Harris, and a young Aitahu man, Philip McGibbon, who've done a lot of work on what they call the politics of love, um, mm. which is what they call a radical equality of politics. And, and I think that notion of the politics of love is in many ways derivative of what I call the politics of whakapapa. That is, how do we build relationships between people, between people and the land? Because in the land, ultimately, is our well-being, which is why if another positive thing comes out of the coronavirus, it is that the land might actually be given some time to heal. The wow. papatuanuku might be given some time to regain her strength. And in the end, a constitutional process that belongs in this land must come from this land. That does not mean that those who've come here because of the treaty will not have a place to make decisions because the treaty gave them that place. But it will be within a system that is derived from this land. I'm going to, I'm conscious it's four o'clock. And uh, Stephen, our moderator, if you could just give me an indication as to when I need to shut this down. I think the next session is at 4.30. But I'm going to ask another question. Moana, for us as Māori and Indigenous people of this land, 
we have lots, lots of non-Māori friends. So this question is, do you have any advice for a Pākehā who wishes to be an ally to Tangata Whenua? I think one of the most inspiring things in the last 20 years of my life um, has been to see the increase in the number of amazing, articulate, genuinely committed, non-Māori people, Asian, Pākehā, whatever, who are committed to supporting Tenora and Chiratanga. And we have always had allies. Um, I remember in my younger days, people like Tom Newnan, David Williams, mm -hmm. Jane Kelsey, too many to mention. But there does now seem to be a greater generational recognition. And there's a, I think a, and I don't think I'm being unduly optimistic or unrealistic. I think there is a generational shift that is happening, a generational momentum for change that is being fueled not just by young Māori, but by young people from other places as well. And that's not only consistent with the treaty relationship, it's actually really personally heartening as well. Mm. Moana, based on your personal and life experiences, uh, Tamati asks, Te nākwe, uh, Moana, what is your advice to a young Māori activist today and for the future? Do you have any words for, for activists as they're coming into this, into this life? I said before, I'm always hesitant to give advice, but I, it's probably what I end up doing. Um, I actually think that if we can hold fast to what our tipuna have left for us, that this is our land, that in the end we will make our own decisions in this land, and that as our tipuna wanted, we're willing to share it with others who will acknowledge our tikanga, acknowledge our recognition. And activists will find different ways of doing that. But if we always remember that this is our land, we belong to it, it belongs to us, and therefore we can make space for those who respect that. So Tamati and all the others, kia ora. Mm, kia ora. Jono Selu says to you, Matua, what's your view on the relationship between Māori and Tangata Mai to Moananui O Kiwa, specifically in relation to Tangata Mai Te Moana living here in Aotearoa and Te Tiriti or Waitangi? Well, I often say one of the worst things that colonisation did to our people was made us forget that we are Pacific peoples. Mm. And so for generations, Pacific Islanders did not include Māori. Pacific Islanders were those people over there, um, people from Samoa or Tonga or whatever, ignoring the differences between those groups and lumping them within an other called Pacific Islanders. And so that created division where history and whakapapa had once bound us together. But in the end, these islands which Tasman called New Zealand. Um, these islands are islands in the Pacific. I often say we're not islands in the Mediterranean or somewhere. We are Pacific islands. And, and I would hope that as our people gain more confidence in who we are as belonging to this land, we will also be able to re-strengthen those ties with our whanaunga in the Pacific. They have never been completely severed, but they have been put under strain. And so we have sometimes forgotten that just as they belong to the Pacific, so do we, and our whakapapa and our history joins us together. Um, I think we're almost near the end of this moana, uh, and I'm just gonna quickly scan. There's lots and lots of questions here. Um, some of them are, some of them are, for example, Holly asks, how do we address institutional racism in the public health sector? Um, I don't know if you want to give that a go. 
Well, the Waitangi Tribunal made a, a recommendation in its whole water report, which I think would go some way to do that. And the recommendation for the establishment of a Māori health authority, um, the Crown has rejected that, um, which I think is short-sighted, um, but typical of a colonising government. Yeah. Um, but racism, as I said before, is not just institutionally confined to something like the criminal justice system or the health system. It is inherent within colonization. And so until we deal to all the, the damage that colonization has done and work towards that goal, then that goal is also the goal of eliminating racism. We may not always eliminate the personal animus of racism, but we can remove that structural institutional racism. And I have this hope that I may not see that in my lifetime, but my mukapuna will see it. What are your thoughts on the deportation of Australian Māori descendants born in Australia? Well, I think that's fairly typical of the basically racist policies which the Australian government follows. Um, I mean, they they have not only been shockingly colonising of our Indigenous brothers and sisters in Australia, um, they had a deliberate policy for years of a white Australian policy, as if though Australia was a white country. Um, and that spills over into things like, oh, let's get rid of this problem with these dark people and send them away. Send them back to where they belong. But if you are born and raised in one place, and that has become the place where you stand, then to shift those people to a place to which they may originally through whakapapa have some link, is I think damaging to those people and damaging to the people to whom they are returned. I think it's an uncaring and unthinking policy that brings with it a number of particular problems um, but puts particular strain, I think, on our people. And I, I just regret, but I'm not surprised that the Australian government has chosen to do that. Do you have any, any final words uh, for us and those that are listening in onto this webinar? Any final words from, your, from yourself? I, I, I just have tremendous faith in our people. Um, we are not perfect um, because we have all the fallibilities of humans. Although I often hasten, hasten to say that, well, we're not perfect unless you're Ngāti Pārāwa Kahumanu. Um, but I have faith that we will overcome all the hardships that we currently face, that we will overcome the injustices of our history and that our mukapuna will live in a better place. And part of that faith comes from my belief that although colonization tried to destroy our faith in ourselves, we've never completely lost that. And if we can hold to our basic humanity, if we can hold to the goodness of who we are, hold to the fact that this land is ours, then our mukapuna will inherit a better place, and I'm confident of that. It's been a real privilege to talk to you, Moana Jackson. I thank you for your time this afternoon. Kia ora. Kia ora, Graham. Thank you, and thank you to those who've been watching. Kia ora. Thank you, everyone.